One of the main ingredients in our product line, Saffron, has been proven over and over again in clinical double-blind placebo trials to be an effective form of treatment for depression, anxiety, and ADHD. Saffron has been used by many cultures for thousands of years for these purposes, and now the research is here to finally back it up, proving that plant medicines and ancient healing practices can actually be an effective alternative to pharmaceuticals. From caffeine-free latte powders to saffron baths and capsules, there's something for any modern woman looking for ancient healing. Again, that's code the fullest podcast at checkout for 15% off. I hope you enjoy your new daily saffron ritual. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Fullest Podcast. I'm your host, Nikki Bostwick, and today's guest is Jessica Diggs, who is a Los Angeles-based licensed midwife, educator, and co-founder of Centered. Hi, Jessica. Hi. I'm so happy to be here. So happy to have this conversation with you on the podcast. I know we did something fun on IG Live a little while ago and I don't even remember it. Like I just remember it was so fun. I'm like, I need to go back and listen to it. But um, I know you shared a lot about Centered on there, but I want to ask you about Centered here as well. But I think like before we get into that, I want to ask about in general, like midwifery. I'm really excited to have that conversation because I shared with you, I had a hospital birth my first birth with my son and then I had a home birth and it was amazing. I loved it. I wish I did a home birth the first time, but I know just, you know, that wasn't my time obviously. So I've had both experiences, but one thing that I think about a lot is as women and you're like the perfect person to ask. I think for me, I have a daughter now and I want to share with her ways that she can connect with her body and learn about her body and how she's going to grow up understanding her different, the functions of her body as a woman. And a lot of women that are, you know, in their teens, I know family members come to me and they say, Hey, like, do you have a good gyno? Do you have someone I can go to? And I'm always like, I don't actually have the answer to that. So I want to ask someone like you, because I went to a midwife when I was like, okay, I want to get pregnant, right? I'm about to get pregnant. Just so you know, I'm about to get pregnant. I want you to be my midwife, right? That's when I went, chose a midwife. But I wish that I had had a relationship with one from the get-go, from the time I started my cycle. So can you share with us about that and like what your vision is and how different cultures have incorporated the relationship with midwifery because i know in the united states we are so out of touch and midwives teach women so much of ancient traditions and we ha- we don't have that anymore in the united states and other cultures do use midwives way more than we do so tell us all things midwifery in that sense of like how midwives educate us from a young age. Yeah, I have been like sitting with this thought for a while. I have liked the phrase midwifery is more, mostly because like we tend to attach the word to birth, rightfully so from most of our cultural exposure to it is typically related to seeing a midwife in a birth setting. But midwifery is so much more than just supporting people through pregnancy and birth. My license extends to all gynecological care. So like that tender, nurturing support where you feel safe and seen and someone sits down and answers the questions in pregnancy can be extended to your pap smear, to your annual labs, or my favorite is actually teens, to all of them exploring their bodies, all the changes, having a safe space and ask questions parents not having to be the only source of those conversations but like 
people don't realize like midwives and midwifery care extends to all aspects of reproductive health. Like you want this person on your team, whether it is a birth or even if it's a loss, like you want some, you want that type of nourishment and holistic care for all aspects of reproductive health. So I have really been dreaming big about how we can implement midwives into every aspect of care. Whether it is the hospital, whether it's admin, whether it is home, like having that lens be applied to all aspects of fertility support, reproductive health is a game changer to how all women are feeling seen and carried and nurtured. And if we can start as early as elementary school, like it would change the world to have a little girl, you know, know their body parts know what's happening and be prepared for the changes of of puberty and then also implement things in their school where they're kind and nurturing to the kid who parent isn't having those conversations but like your child is well equipped well nurtured at home that they can easily like I even as a child I like carried tampons with me before I had a period (laughs) so I'm like someone might need it (laughs) so someone might need it and I was the kid who knew more than I needed to know early, early on because I was curious. So I'm like, if we can start changing people's experiences around their body as early on, we would reduce shame. We would uh, ignite curiosity. We would improve pleasure for that time. When that time comes, like, you know, we would improve consent and actually enjoy living in our bodies as women the entire time and not just pieces of that time. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. And I completely agree. And I'm curious, though, if you would say a lot of midwives, like, if let's say someone's at home listening to this conversation, they're like, you know what, I want my daughter who's of elementary school age, and of course, we're not getting this education anywhere, no matter where you're going, like you're not getting the same education as like coming from directly from a midwife. So someone's at home and they're saying, hey, I want to connect with a midwife who can offer me this information for my elementary school daughter? Like how often do you recommend, you know, someone taking, you know, what's excessive, right? And what's not excessive? What did other cultures do um, to prepare these young women to learn about their bodies? Like, is it something as simple as, and I'm sure everyone's different, right? There's no one size fits all. So when you were sharing it with me, I was like, oh, cool. Um, maybe I'll incorporate it. I mean, I'm all about homeschooling and like trying to figure out how I can create my own education system for my children. And so it's like, for me, I would be like, oh, cool. I'll have a midwife come and just hang with me and my daughter, you know, once a month. And we just like talk about our bodies or whatever. But like, of course, not every midwife is equipped to come to the house, right? It's, it's hard to find a midwife to begin with in the United States, let alone find someone in your area who you connect with. That's why I love Centered. You know, Centered is obviously for doulas, but would you say that it's a different type of, is it, like, is this something that you would think like doulas can patch down as well? Yeah. Is it strictly midwife? Yeah, because I think this is based, it's more education based and kind of like the tangibles around resources and resource share, which doulas are more than equipped to do. And they do this for birth all the time. So I think this can be fueled if more people are educators, whether formally or informally. So it could be doulas. It can be just parents, like parents taking a course and digesting it and then realizing how to disseminate it to their children as they move through different age groups. And not just their daughters, yeah. like their sons too. Like they're either yeah. engaging yeah. with their own bodies or maybe engaging with a female body at some point, whether it's a friendship or a romantic season of life. Like we're not like mutually exclusive. We typically intertangled in many ways. So I think that for me, if I was to envision and was talking to a child, I would start very basic from birth with the functionality of like breasts and like milk and you know because that's just a lot of exposure anyway because you're typically nude in front of your child so as they're curious talking about your anatomical features 
anatomically correctly. <laughs> so naming them, talking about functionality as it makes sense to that age and continuing to do that on and on again. Normalizing conversations around period as the mom, um, normalizing conversations around how that affects your day-to-day -day life. If you're more sluggish, why? Naming that hormone, progesterone, makes me more sluggish before my period comes. And like normalizing that in basic conversation, there's always a ton of books too, um, especially if you get to the season of life where you're reading a book all the time to little people, reading books that are exciting and normalize anatomy. And then as the conversation gets older and they are in elementary school, we see what is happening to the endocrine system of little people. So periods are starting earlier and sooner and not necessarily a good thing, but that's the reality. So people, your kid is probably going to encounter someone who started their period in elementary school. Wow. Having that conversation so that this kid is not shamed, you know, they can't always, con a child can definitely not control their endocrine reaper. Like, that's not their, that's not yeah. their problem. That's an adult's issue and a system issue. So this kid shouldn't be shamed and they're often going to be very isolated until middle school where more people are having their actual menstrual cycle. So I would say as much as you can talk about it and normalize it, share your experience, have the people in your community share theirs, that can get the ball rolling. And then I would say late elementary, early middle, bringing in experts. Ideally, there's more apps and more accessible you know, tools, videos, or your local resources to actually talk about these things even having your school system I know you homeschool but if there is a local school system for those listening asking them to pay a midwife for a couple hours to come in and actually teach do the sex ed because what currently exists is disturbing so that would be my how I would approach it start small at home get involved at school and then keep the conversation going I love that and another thing, and I know you know this about us, we have public steaming herb mm -hmm. and a whole ritual kit that we sell on our website. And that's something that um, I used in my postpartum healing journey, but then started incorporating just um, on a monthly basis because of how beneficial it is for all women. And I've become like now so much more into it and have a steamy chick certification for it mm -hmm. so I can really more and understand it more for my personal life and for our customers but I learned so much about it and how you know these are midwives that would have passed down mm -hmm. this information and a lot of people want to buy it from us and we've realized we need to do a lot more education on it because their OB doesn't know about mm -hmm. it or doesn't share with them how to properly steam when to do it when not to do it because there are contraindications so I'm curious like are there other practices like that that you like to incorporate like there's steaming there's castor oil packs mm -hmm. um what other like fun things are there that you like to share and incorporate with your clients yeah I love steaming um I would say my bigger recommendations are often steaming acupuncture and cupping and daily walks like reducing the cortisol in your body from something as simple as a 20 minute walk is a game changer we've seen there was an amazing study um two women walked 20 minutes every day and reduce their risk of heart disease which is the number one killer particularly if these were black women by 60 just 20 minutes so it doesn't have to be this an hour you know something that feels unattainable with the day-to-day -day time restraints we have so i'm like i've been big into small digestible changes that are transformate transformative so acupuncture is one that we know is beautiful and has many many healing properties steaming you can do in your own home is usually very affordable and daily walks are free. One of the other things I loved about this two women's story is that because they were walking so often, they noticed a neighborhood. 
they notice the needs in their neighborhood and then they build a park and then they started collecting other people in community and so like getting out and seeing who's around us also connects us to the humans who live near us and you know the streets we want to protect and the kids we want to see grow up and thrive so those three things are kind of my go-to's I like cash oil packs I think they're so messy but I'm like I do love them <laughs> um I like to keep it real with people because sometimes reinvigorating all these ancient ways I'm also like how can we make it that you can do it regularly because if you're only doing it once in a while it's not helpful um I love dry pressing br- brushing that's one of my favorite go-to's it's super easy I typically do it before evening shower And I'm trying to think of any other ones that I tend to recommend a lot. I will say for parents and doulas, I often um, recommend, this is a very weird one, not using any lights for a couple days in a row. So when the lights go off, just using candles and it helps to reset your circadian rhythm and it's so nourishing and it's free. And it sets like a mood in the house. It's my, like my apartment's super sexy with all the candles, or, you know, lit for a night. And I usually do it two nights in a row and just don't turn on any fluorescent lights for the evening. So when the sun goes down, you kind of have some cozy evening. It does a world of wonder for your hormones and your circadian rhythm. And it's free. I love that. And I need to do that because I always, I've been thinking about it a lot because my son needs to turn on every single light in the entire house and on full blast so bright and i'm like no like let's so my husband and I like no let's not turn it on and then he'll turn it on and it's like and i keep thinking okay it's our preference but let's you know incorporating i just love ritual mm-hmm. so incorporating ritual into our lives makes things so special and things that like you said are so simple that that's how people live mm-hmm. forever right I was like getting him his own little lantern. Yeah. Like a safe, you know, lantern that he can't touch the flame. But getting him his own little lantern would be super empowering. He can lug it around. And it can be so fun to have this like monthly ritual where we do a weekend reset as a family. I like the idea for teens too. I don't have a teen, but like the idea of turning off, especially when you're inundated with screens and things from schoolwork to just staying social as a teen right now. I'm like doing two nights of like, just turn off could be so helpful to their endocrine systems. It's yeah. such a good idea. It's such a good idea. I love that. So do you not use your phone then? I try really hard. I usually put it on do not disturb and on the other side of the room and wow. really try to do go really hard and not use the phone. If I do do it, my phone's always on low lit anyway. So it's like really, really, really yeah. dimmed. That's such a good idea. I, I mean, I always fantasize about like, having a house phone and (laughs) I go hard on like these ideas, but it really is important because we are so far removed from nature. Mm -hmm. Like you said, Mm -hmm. getting outside for 20 minutes, going on a walk, especially as a parent, Mm -hmm. it can be a huge like deal Mm -hmm. to get outside and your kids on a walk because they're screaming and they don't want to, or they're tired or they're not on the same page. Right. And everyone's just like, I don't want to do this or I want to go to this. I want to, my son, I want to go this way because it's right next to the fire station. And then my daughter's like, do not even put me in the stroller. I will lose my shit on you. So it's just like to stay inside, but really getting outside and just going even around the block. Like I've um, interviewed people where there's a science sharing how the wind even gives our body information. Mm -hmm. Like we're getting into, from the sun we're getting information from this the wind the rain all the elements like they actually are like you said that we're getting more regulated yeah. from it from the air so it's not only like great for exercise and for hopefully like family time or girlfriend time but it really does actually make a difference and a huge impact on your health and well-being and getting you more in tune, which is like why I love all these rituals. So yeah, I think it is a really awesome idea to unwind and, and whether you're pregnant or want to become pregnant, like all of these practices connect you to your body. And that's what 
midwifery is really about, right? Like it's really about, and birth, birth is about <laughs> connecting you to your body. It's like the ultimate way to be like, oh my God, I can't, I have like, I have no control, but actually like you can have control, but it's not about control, I guess. It's like, you can be in sync but be out of control at yes. the same time, yep. you know? Yep. Yeah, it's the, uh, that's, I mean, one, that's why I love 20 minutes. Like, it is digestible, it is doable, and it can be a ritual. It is not an hour. It's not something that feels unattainable. And then if you're doing it regularly, it creates such a transition in your body, in your mind, that is a game changer. And then as we move into other reproductive systems like birth or pregnancy, you already have a habit. You already have something that is nourishing you that comes back to support you in labor. I tend to say like you birth how you live. So even if you couldn't do all the things in the nine months or you were sick or whatever the case is, you have ingrained your body with some muscle memory for all the things you've been doing that is helpful and nourishing that comes back. Hi, everyone. I want to take a second to share about my dear friend, Carson Myers brand, Sea and the Moon. Carson has been a guest on our show, so if you happen to listen to that episode, you would know she launched Sea in the Moon with its debut product, the Malibu Made Body Scrub. This scrub uses brown sugar to gently exfoliate and delivers lasting hydration through a variety of organic botanical oils like almond, jojoba, coconut, and castor seed oil, and it's scented with a food-grade vanilla. The Malibu Made Body Scrub was born out of a necessity to nourish dry and sensitive skin without the use of harmful chemicals that are often found in everyday personal care products. As a doula, Carson saw firsthand how much information the skin takes in from the environment around it, including the many studies that have shown direct test results of over hundreds of chemicals that were found in umbilical cord blood and passed down from mother to child not to mention the detrimental impacts man-made chemicals that are found in conventional skincare products have on our environment as a whole. The Malibu Made Body Scrub is made with organic, non-toxic ingredients and packaged in a waste-free glass jar that can be upcycled for continuous use. Sea in the Moon proudly donates a portion of its proceeds to the Natural Resources Defense Council, which is an organization that brings together scientists and lawyers to defend the health of Mother Earth. The Malibu Made Body Scrub has been called a miracle product by those who suffer from chronic dry skin and deemed the best scrub ever by Kim Kardashian. So for 20% off your Sea in the Moon order, use code FULLEST20 at checkout. I'm so excited to talk to you about Healthy Line. It's a brand I absolutely love and trust, and they're offering 10% off Fullest Podcast listeners and free shipping if you use code The Fullest at checkout. If you haven't heard of Healthy Line, they have totally revolutionized heat therapy. They use PEMF mats and far infrared mats that are designed to improve your health and wellness using natural gemstone heat therapy. Their nature inspired medical devices will really help you on your motherhood journey as well if you're a mom because having kids can really drain you. They have so much energy, they're so wonderful, but keeping up with them is so difficult. So if you're a mom that needs a little bit of an extra boost throughout the week and and you don't want to rely on just coffee or matcha for that, I would definitely invest in this. You can even get just a small mat. You get 20 to 40 minutes, maybe a few times a week on the mat, or you can even sleep on it. It's totally safe to sleep on, and you get that extra boost in energy to help keep up with life because there's so much that we're bombarded with throughout the day, and stress is a huge part of chronic illness. And if you're able to calm your nervous system to really get to a place of relaxation 
and recouping, then you're really able to get ahead of so many of the symptoms of disease that we all experience, whether that's something you're dealing with that's an autoimmune condition, your postpartum, you're working on your fertility, you really just want to be really great in terms of fitness and recovery from a workout, whatever it is that you're working on, laying on a PEMF mat is totally going to regulate you. And it's something that I really believe in. This is how I get in my heat therapy. So I'm so excited that you guys get 10% off anything on their website, including free shipping. Just use code the fullest at checkout and you'll get that discount. What is your like number one recommendation to a laboring mother? Obviously everyone's different. Mm. Everyone's labor looks different. But I was told when I went into labor with my daughter, right before I went into labor with her, my chiropractor said to me one day, and I just will never forget it. She said, make sure you look down because when you have your chin down, that means your pelvic floor is open. Mm -hmm. And it like, instead of feeling so out of control with your neck up and trying to really like tense up because I totally did that with my son and so the whole time I kind of did a lock jaw you know how you would do in like yoga with like breathing Mm -hmm. and I own I like just tried my best to like I would scream through each contraction but just like owned through it like very intensely literally held on to my husband's arms and neck like I'm probably bruised him like crazy, obviously, but I was just trying so hard, but I, that was so helpful to me. Cause I was like, okay, my net, my pelvic floor does feel open. So I am always curious. Like, what is one, you know, tip that you like to share? Yeah. Oh, uh, in the labor, I usually say something like blow that one away. And what I usually mean if I'm having a person like connect it, like people hold their breath, they tense up and I'm like, no, blow it out, move it through your body. And if you feel that like tense up quickly and then when you kind of blow it out, your diaphragm drops, your pelvic floor drops, your hands release, everything kind of moves down. So I tend to say something like blow that one all away and like maybe a rub over like their hands that are tight or their, you know, back or something. And if people really have a hard time connecting or comic relief is going to be just as helpful, I will say blow it out like you're blowing out a fart, like release. Yeah. Some people can't connect and that's just the world we live in. And as much as yeah. I want people to have that body connection they don't and so you're teaching in the moment and I usually will say something like no like you're trying to let out a fart blow it out and not like pushing just like that release of the butt cheeks game changer I love that and I I agree like with my first I mean and it's your first you don't know what you don't know what to expect so you have all this anxiety built up you know you're like all these people have done this before me but like you have maybe some shame because you don't know why you're feeling the way you do. And like our bodies are built to do this. There's so many emotions and, and it's a beautiful way to say that. Just blow it away. Just blow it out. It's so, so cool that you have that as a way to coach, because I really think, I mean, you can turn like blue and literally just hold things. So many shades. And then like also um, I will say with how we envision birth, like people think that they need to be kept like kept in this like calm, silent. And it's like, no, like you can roar this kid out and it might need to be like a visceral experience. So it might be like release, like blow it out, whether it's like or like oming or whatever the case is. But like sounds, there's usually sounds associated with it. And I think like like to sex, like some people are silent partners. I probably wouldn't lean that direction, but like there's sounds yeah. involved with what you're feeling. If you're trying so hard to be like con- controlled, it's, you're not usually laboring or probably having sex well. Like you get to experience it. And some of that comes with some emotion and some expressions. And so I like to give people permission to like l- uncage that beast, let it out. Like you're not scaring anyone here unleash now is the time yeah and i've heard okay so what is your experience with this i've heard 
the more people at your birth, the longer it could last. <laughs> Is that with it? Um, I will say generally, yes. However, I tend to tell people to really take inventory of who they are. And the way in which I talk through this is as humans, we can span the mammal kind of like variation. So with birth, you could be very much a cat. You can't find a cat in labor. You wake up to kittens. Like, you cannot find them. And they do it solitary, cold, dark place by themselves. You can be the dolphin typically does it with one other person with one other dolphin we're not sure if that's the male dolphin or another female dolphin or you can be the elephant who's very big and very vulnerable when they go down so they actually have the whole herd present all of us can ebb and flow and i typically tell my clients like really take an inventory of who you are and how you think you will respond my latina client probably wants her whole family there and i've been to births where yeah. it's 13 of us and that's how they roll for big experiences and i love that and i welcome it yeah and then i have some clients who are like i love you babe but i also need space and having permission to be the cat when you're partnered yeah um or the dolphin and that other person might be more their doula than their partner or vice versa like I like to give permission for all aspects of how we move through life. And culturally, some of us do it in really big groups and some of us don't. Yeah. But if we are doing it in a big group, to your point, because I do see that if you feel like a watch pot, the birth is way longer. That group needs to come with a purpose. Everyone has a task. Everyone is understands that you may change your mind about them being there. And then we always have a safe space in the home, meaning if you go into the bedroom, no one comes behind you and yeah. everyone understands that you need a break. You need a break from all of the people. So, yes, I typically tell my clients if they're going to have a lot of family, don't have the family come over in early labor. You won't tip over into active and to have them come in active with purpose to how they're supporting you, not just to watch. Yeah, that makes sense. It's like you do this, you prep this food, you, you like everyone has a job, so you don't feel like because a lot of times, yeah, you just start to feel bad. Mm -hmm. Like you're like, oh, all these people are here basically to watch me perform <laughs> this baby, and like yeah. it's taking long. So then you feel bad, and you you want them to have sleep, and you're like forgetting that it's about you, you yeah. and baby only. Yeah. And if you are not that person who can really advocate for yourself in that light, it's not going to come out in labor. You're going to feel more stressed about people taking care of you. I've had yeah. one birth that I vividly remember. Everyone had a job and it was a long birth. It was close to 48 hours, but there was a, dr she had all the elements of the earth in for her birth. So it was like earth, wind, fire and water in some aspects and there was a person who manned a fire outside the entire birth this man sat outside and kept this fire burning there was a person doing a sound bath all night long there was a drummer oh my god <laughs> and it was insane i was like wow and then there was the person who land like her landlord was this elder like 70 plus year old woman she came up and prayed at one point i was like where'd you come from it was insane amount of people and then as they all had a job though they were not in the space as soon as that baby was born the drummer the fire person the sound bath came in made this like amazing nourishing soup fed her and then left like i don't even i can't put faces to these people because i didn't see them for 24 hours they did something and then they left wow that's beautiful and it was I think at one point, like 15 of us. That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm the type of person that's like, I wanted my mom there, but then I was like, no, I know I'm going to get like irritated about something dumb mm -hmm. and I'll just like my partner only and like midwife. And yeah. So I also was going to ask you because I feel like a lot of times, you know, we get as women, as pregnant women, like we get so excited about the due date mm -hmm. and then we're stuck on the due date and then, you know, baby doesn't come and it's from there, 
if you're a home birther, then you're like, oh, what if baby doesn't come on time? Or you start to get in your head. For me too, I was like, I'm short. So I'm like five one or I sometimes used to say five two. That's what I was just like about to say. So I was like really confused. I was like, am I five one or five two? Um, I'm short and I my body expanded like so quickly both times. And I was like so stressed out about it because of stretch marks. And so I wasn't like really stressed my pregnancy, but then once do, the due date like hit with my daughter, I was like, okay, I'm ready. She needs to come out. Like, I'm fine. I don't have any stretch marks. Let's go. Like, you know, but I really had to relax into it because I noticed that with my son, I, the first thing, like, I just thought my water had broken and it was like a little trickle. It wasn't anything. And I, because of that experience, I know that it led to so much of what happened at the hospital because it was like, I, my water broke my, so I made my um, OB test it and he tested it with a strip. It was my water breaking. So then like they ended up giving me, so I don't even know the name, Cytotech. It's order to like induce me and all these things happen because know when your water breaks you have to have a baby within 24 hours whatever all these rules it's not like my water actually broke and it was like coming out and babies didn't have amniotic fluid so there's so much that we just don't realize and because we like to rush through things and even with natural births I feel like I've noticed just through my experience of really having to surrender and be like okay baby's gonna come when she comes and that whole week leading up to baby like I feel like I went in and out of labor, you know, and I had to surrender. And I feel like sometimes we're like, okay, we're in labor. And like, so let's keep it going. Let's take castor oil. Let's do all these things. It's just natural anyways, who cares? And so I might, I I guess I'm like leading up to this question. I guess my question to you is like, when, at what point do you like to use these interventions, even when they're not considered natural? Because when I'm learning about in my personal life in like birthing life and like all this stuff is like we just love to overdo it and even with like supplements I'm realizing now I'm like I don't need to take vitamin d I live in southern California and it's sunny like I'm just gonna go get sun I love that feeling and it's so empowering to say you know I don't I'm nothing bad about supplements. Like I sell whole food based supplements on my website. I love them and I believe in them and I take them, but let's take inventory of what we need and when we need it. And I really believe that when it comes to our everyday lives and birth. So like talking about castor oil, I know that sometimes like it's used and that's great and it can help, but I also know it can cause like complications too. And like, let's be aware of it so we don't do it we don't need to yeah i i mean i think this conversation is something i kind of come back to a lot with clients as a midwife we are balancing you know holding space for cultural expectations of these humans who are inundated with a lot of pressure so when they hit this due date when they've been ingrained that it's an expiration date yeah. it's either this baby's supposed to come out on this date that they've given you this entire nine months and you told everyone around you or there's something that goes wrong and this baby just somehow expires inside of you like it's milk after this date like we've been told that for so long so i'm holding space for someone who's been ingrained with that trying to ease that in the moment and then also in california my license only allows me to support someone until 42 weeks for outside of hospital birth so i'm like okay i have two weeks to make sure this person knows that going past your due date is absolutely normal (laughs) to also hold space for their anxiety because they don't want to risk out of what they envision is for this home birth you know this entire time so in my practice i talk to my clients that are usually around 38 and 39 weeks it's like shorter visits we're just waiting for a baby all is normal we don't start talking natural induction stuff until 41 weeks and that's the earliest that i will i'm willing to chat about it and yeah. if someone is like uncomfortable, like there's some some anatomical things going on outside of them just being pregnant, yeah. we can start talking about things for relief because I don't want someone miserable going into labor. But if they're just comfortably, as comfortably as they can be at 40 weeks, we're not talking about 
any of that until 41. And then we have a very gentle process to encourage the body to go into labor, but also essentially feel, make my client feel like they're doing something <laughs> every day. But also the thing is very, very benign. And then we might utilize like castor oil. The earliest in which I usually do it in my practice is 41 and four. So we are well into that week. And I've given them a lot of time to go into labor spontaneously. And I probably use castor oil maybe like once a quarter because some people do just gestate longer. (laughs) They hold those kids in. And unfortunately, my hands are tied with how long I can legally and comfortably, some evidence too, like comfortably let them go. But... I don't have to use it that often because I just give them more time. We're obviously checking on baby, easing all the mind, and like p- making sure they know like with this test, with this exam, I just listened to baby. They're telling us they're just comfy in there and all is well. The placenta is fine. You're safe. Now you have to really believe that. And I'm, I re- try to reflect that to my clients. I believe that I have all of this proof that your baby is fine. They just need a little bit of time. So let's give them a little bit of time. And if they hit this date, we will evict them. <laughs> but let's give them some time before we get there. And nine times out of 10, we don't need that induction. Wow. I love that. I really, really admire that because I think a lot of times it's just, you know, let's do it and mom wants it and we got to do it. And- just becomes this whole like anxiety driven process rather than baby's fine. Let's just, you know, stay calm and give it, it just wants to stay in there longer. Like that is, it's crazy how we just get so deep in our head. And that's the one thing that we want to be able to not do as we go into, you know, but it is, It's one of those things that I try really hard not to shame parents about because like you're a parent, you are deeply vulnerable and you haven't been given a lot of great examples or like cultural norms to be like, to to allow you to just settle Yeah. either. Like there's not, everything's telling you to just be a nervous wreck. (laughs) So I'm always like, well, or you just have every single person in the world asking you, oh, baby hasn't come yet. You're still pregnant. Oh my, like everywhere you go, that is offensive. It is very, it is overwhelming. I I like joke with my clients. I, I had one client, they actually pit, uh, picked a picture off the internet and started sending it to people the last week that anytime <laughs> someone would ask them, they'd be like, oh yeah, we had the baby three days ago. <laughs> Just to oh get the God. reaction. It's like, you see how stupid it is as if we wouldn't tell you that we have, you know, know, and it's annoying. So I'm going to get some kicks out of it while I wait <laughs> too. It, but I, I feel for parents and I tell my clients this a lot, like the container I want to create as a midwife is one where you can feel safe enough to practice being a parent, practice having the conversations around your choices, practice saying no to people, practice making decisions. Like, which supplement should I be taking? Which risk am I comfortable with? Which pediatrician do I align with? And some are really low stakes, but feel high. Like I got a client asked me about what type of lotion she should use. And I'm like, that's, an, you, that's one you can figure out on your own. Like if you can't figure that one out, we got bigger issues. I know. <laughs> but yeah. if there are bigger ones of like, where do I get credible sources from? and about insert you know thing and I'm like this is a safe space to practice having those conversations and standing up for yourself and deciding what is safe for you and your baby because you'll be doing it forever and so we talk about it I just came across some information about how mothers retain their baby's DNA like we retain that and we have this like telepathic relationship as well and that's the mother's intuition and that's something that's just so beautiful and now science can prove how important it is and how as parents we really need to listen to that and birth is just a beautiful way of activating our intuition and I am so inspired by it over and over again and and I'm so grateful to women like you that have dedicated their lives to this and how I'm sure how fulfilling it is for you. It's also just so incredible for others to have access to 
someone as passionate about their career and what they're doing in the world. So I just love talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on. And I just hope to continue to have different like conversations as things come up. I think as a platform, I, um, we have so many women that have questions. We have so much that we align with and I want to continue the conversation and anyone listening, feel free to reach out, ask questions and maybe Jessica and I can just continue, you know, discussing because it's a never ending and oh, there's always stuff coming up and different experiences. And Jessica is so, so kind to share her time with us. Thank you so much, Jessica. You're so welcome. I'm always available for these conversations and forms of education, whether you're local to LA or not, like an email away. Oh, so nice. Thank you. So wonderful having you. Have a great day. You too.